Okay, so we're going to focus today on how we got <clears throat> complex organisms as we know them. Okay, so the evolution basically from the more simplistic prokaryote into the eukaryote, um, as well as look a little bit closer at those diagrams that show that lineage. Uh, so to do that, we're going to start with a brief review of living things. Remember some of the characteristics that something needs to be had to be considered living. Okay, so to be considered the first living thing or the common ancestor. These are some of the things that it would have had to have had. Okay, so first of all, remember all living things are made up of cells. And it doesn't matter about the complexity of the cell. It can be a simple prokaryote or it could be a more complex eukaryotic uh, plant cell or animal cell. Okay, as long as it's made up of cells. Remember from our vocabulary, cells are the simplest form of living things. So it is believed that the very first life form was one single cell. And that that is that common ancestor to everyone. That that is the very first uh, life form that existed. One of the other things that all living things have uh, the capability to do is to reproduce. Remember, that was one of the reasons why we considered a virus a non-living thing, because viruses can't reproduce without a host cell, okay? but bacterial cells can. Prokaryotes can reproduce uh, via binary fission. Uh, eukaryotic cells, they can reproduce uh, via mitosis. Okay? So all living cells have the ability to reproduce. Some other characteristics of living things. So remember, they all have to contain DNA. They all contain uh, their instructions in the form of DNA. Remember, DNA is transcribed and translated into proteins. And all living things are also going to do metabolism. Okay? And so when they do metabolism, they're going to require an energy source. We're usually in the form of ATP. There's the adenosine and the three phosphates, the triphosphate. So we use ATP as a source of cellular energy. Um, all living things are going to use ribosomes to be able to translate the DNA into a protein. Okay, so these are things that all living things have in common with their metabolism. They use similar molecules and similar processes. Okay, so similar molecules like the ATP. Okay, they use a similar process like the protein synthesis. Okay, all of these things show linkage you know, to a common ancestor. They all rely on enzymes, various enzymes that are needed to carry out chemical reactions, okay, and they're all going to contain that DNA. Okay. Um, in addition, all living things, remember, they can also do homeostasis. Remember, homeostasis is maintaining that constant balance. We have been talking about stasis uh, in class just the other day. Remember, with stasis, things stay the same. They're stationary. Okay, um, homeo would be man or um, self, and so we're, we're maintaining things to be the same. Okay, so with homeostasis, uh, we're maintaining that balance of water, nutrient levels, energy levels. Okay, all living things do those, whether that's a prokaryotic bacterial cell or it's a human. We all do homeostasis. So those are all characteristics of living things. Again, we're made up of cells. Uh, we can do reproduction. We have similar metabolism. Um, we can uh, all have DNA to code for our proteins, and we all do homeostasis. So it's believed that the first living thing was a prokaryotic cell. And remember, a prokaryotic cell, these are our bacterial cells. They have no membrane-bound organelles. Okay? They are still going to have DNA. It's just not going to be in, closed in a nucleus in a membrane. So they're still going to have DNA. They're still going to have cytoplasm and ribosomes. Okay? Remember, they have to be able to make proteins. Remember, ribosomes technically are not a membrane-bound organelle. Okay? So many, most scientists believe that the first living thing was a prokaryotic cell, so this more simplistic kind of cell, and that it was not just a, any kind of prokaryote, that, that it was a heterotroph. A heterotrophic prokaryotic cell. Remember, a heterotroph has to get its food from an outside source. Okay, so this is what's called the um, heterotroph hypothesis. And the heterotroph hypothesis again is going to state that this first prokaryote, this first organism, was a heterotrophic prokaryote, which means it had to consume its food. Uh, these were some ways that it could do it. 
uh, through the process of, remember, phagocytosis, where we take in cell eating. We take in large molecules. Uh, penocytosis, or the cell drinking, where they just form that invagination on the cell membrane, and um, it's not as specific. Basically, whatever's there falls in, and they take it into the cell. Or one that we did not talk about, but it's called receptor-mediated endocytosis. Um, basically, if it has to match with the receptor, and if it matches with the receptor, then it can be taken into the cell. But all of those are different ways that this prokaryote could be heterotrophic, that it could take in food so that it could um, then produce ATP from that food. It's then thought that over time that some of these heterotrophic um, prokaryotes became, uh, we developed, uh, they developed autotrophs. So there were autotrophic prokaryotes, uh, similar to what's called cyanobacteria. It's a current bacteria that we have that is an autotroph. Okay, so cyanobacteria is a, um, a basically a photosynthetic kind of bacteria. And so if you look at this one, okay, this bacteria that's here, okay, it's getting a little more complex here. Okay, it's got a little more um, going on. Okay, it's got thylakoids, just like a chloroplast does, so that it can, um, it's got membranes inside of it, so that it can um, create those gradients to be able to perform photosynthesis. And so in this case, it's making its own food. Okay, and so from here, scientists came up with what is called the endosymbiotic theory. So endosymbiotic theory states basically that eukaryotes are, were essentially big giant prokaryotes that took in smaller prokaryotes. So a eukaryotic cell was really a fusion of two prokaryotic cells, one big one and one small one, that eventually became so dependent upon one another that they could not live independently. Now you can see this happening in this diagram here. So we start with the original prokaryotic cell. Okay, over time, remember, all cells have cytoplasm, DNA, um, a plasma membrane, remember a cell membrane, and ribosomes. And so over time, those that cell membrane okay, started to fold in and form things, form organelles like a nucleus and the endoplasmic reticulum. Because remember, they are membrane-bound organelles, and they're membrane-bound organelles because they have the same membrane around them that's around the cell itself. Okay? And you can see in this one here, okay, it engulfed the aerobic heterotrophic prokaryote, okay, which later would become the mitochondria that are able to produce ATP. Okay, and then some of these larger prokaryotic cells also took in these smaller photosynthetic prokaryotes. So then they had a mitochondria in them and what now later became the chloroplast. And so we've got the endo, it's inside of it, okay, and the symbiosis, and they obviously have a very good relationship. Um, some evidence for this would be if we look at current mitochondria and chloroplasts. So if you look at this comparison that we have here, okay, we've got a mitochondria up here. And the prokaryote are both of these over here. And here's our chloroplast. And so if you look at the mitochondria and the chloroplast compared to the bacteria, okay, they are very similar. Both of them are very similar in size. They have their own DNA. Mito mitochondria and chloroplast both have their own set of DNA, as well as has their own set of ribosomes so they can produce their own proteins. Okay? Um, they can also do binary fission, which is how prokaryotic cells reproduce. They split into two. Okay? So a current mitochondria that you have in your cell, okay, if you look, you see it has its own ribosomes. Okay? The chloroplast has its own ribosomes as well. Okay? It's got its own DNA in it. You can see the mitochondrial DNA and the nucleoid region of the chloroplast with its own DNA. Again, it can, it's about the same size and it can also do binary fission. So all, these homologies, these similarities, remember we like that word homologies, these homologies lend support to this endosymbiotic theory that um, these prokaryotes um, are, that our current organelles, the ancestors to our current organelles are pr old prokaryotic cells. Okay, so that's our main theory for um, basically the complexity of the cell that we have now up to a eukaryotic cell, animal cell, a plant cell. Okay, um, and so we're going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to look a little bit closer at phylogenetic trees and cladograms 
a little bit more about how to read them, how to build one. If you can build one, you can probably read one so that we can work with those also some more in class. Okay, so let's take a look at these evolutionary diagrams. So first of all, let's start with the term phylogeny in general. Phylogeny is just our study of these evolutionary relationships. Okay, so we're looking at the evolutionary relationships either within an organism, you know, amongst an organism, for instance, following elephants all the way through, or among a group of organisms, and we're trying to compare them. Okay, um, this what we have down here would be an example of a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram. These two words a lot of times are used uh, interchangeably. Really, your only difference is your phylogenetic tree is a definite and your cladogram is more of a prediction. Okay, um, that your phylogenetic tree is proven. Your cladogram is based on what we the evidence we have that may have a couple of gaps. This is what we're pretty sure. Okay, but they look you know pretty much the same. Okay, so we'll probably we'll be using these terms interchangeably. Okay, so um, this would be an example of a phylogenetic tree. Okay, you can see the different branch points here and as these organisms branch off. Okay, and we, we base these relationships, we base these phylogenies on uh, morphology. Morphology is going to be what they look like. Okay, so morphology, which we're going to get from the fossil record. Okay, so those would be one of the things that we use to build a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram. Um, if we know information about the embryology, we could build a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram showing relationships based on embryology. And then the biomolecular stuff, DNA, RNA, uh, protein synthesis, protein similarities, like we talked about with your cytochrome C on one of your homeworks. You know, we were comparing the different proteins. Okay, so DNA, RNA, and the proteins. So these are all things that we can base these phylogeny, these relationships on. When we're building the tree, these are the different parts. Okay, so just one little line there. That's your species or your population at any given point in time. Okay, and you may even see these lines turned um, sideways to indicate that we're talking about this particular area right here. Okay, your big long line, okay, so for instance, something like that. Okay, your big long line is going to represent your population as it's progressing through a long period of time. Okay, and you can see it on a phylogenetic tree that's maybe turned sideways like this one. Okay, you may also see it, you, may, you notice the last one we had was built more up and down, right? And so you may have a phylogenetic tree that is built like that, and it's still the same though. This would then just put time on our side here. Okay, and so these long periods here, things like that, like that, okay, they're just representing the population as it's moving through time. Okay, um, one of the most important things is going to be our branch points or our nodes. Uh, you can see one there, branch point, branch point, a branch point right there. Okay, so these branch points or nodes, this is where the split happens. This is where the divergence happens and the two populations go their separate directions. Okay, and they're leading to different species here. When we have this branch point, okay, it should give rise to only two lineages, like right here where I've got B and C. Okay, when I do things like, for instance, down here, where I have D, E, and F, where I have more than two of them, okay, that shows that this is unresolved. There is no definitive here. There is something else that's going to separate that third one of those out. Uh, we just may have it, maybe haven't found it yet. Okay, but it should give rise to only two ending lineages. More than that is going to show an unresolved issue. The other things we need to be aware of is that these diagrams can be drawn um, and say the exact same thing, even though they may look a little bit different. Like if you look at this one here, these uh, particular diagrams here have been rotated. Okay, so these two diagrams say the exact same thing. Okay, I've got um, A, B, and C are all grouped together. Okay, A is the outlier for those. Okay, and that's what I have over here on the right. Okay, I've got A as by itself with B and C together, and then a common ancestor for D, E, and F. And the same thing over here, a common ancestor for D, E, and F. These are the exact same diagrams. They say the exact same thing. I've got branch points leading to the exact same organism. 
And so these two would be comparable. It wouldn't matter which one you had. Like I said, they tell you the exact same thing. What you guys will have to be able to do is compare and look for, you know, is it telling me the exact same thing? Or did I have, um, let's say I had my, so it looked like this. And then when I came down here instead, that now shows something different, okay? Because now it shows A and C having a more common recent ancestor right here than B and C, okay? And so this one would be different. It would not show the exact same thing as the other two, okay? So you'll need to be able to tell the difference between them. And like I said before, you're also gonna need to be able to build them. So we're gonna look at an example here. We're gonna walk through you know, how we would build this and how we would put it together so that you can start doing some of that in class. So what I have here is what's called a character table. And um, these are very helpful to me in trying to build these relationships and see what I have going on. So this particular one is gonna be based on morphology. Okay? It's not based on amino acid sequences or proteins. Okay? It's just based on what they look like. What physical characteristics do they have? Okay? And so if you look at this, I have one, okay, the lancelet, which is my, gonna be my outlayer, my out group. Okay, and then I've got this, and this is arranged nicely for me with all of my characters going in order of who has it and who does not. Okay, and so I see all the rest of them, the lamprey through the, le through the leopard, all the rest of them have a backbone. So that backbone, that characteristic of a backbone would be where we've branched off, right? Where the, the populations have gone their separate directions. So if I'm drawing this, okay, I've got my lancelet up here, and everybody else has branched off down here by getting to have a backbone. And now as I go through these, I continue to work my way through it. So my next characteristic, like I said, this chart goes nice in order for me. My next characteristic would be the hinged jaw. Okay, so the lamprey has a backbone, so it's got to come after where I've put the backbone column, but it does not have a hinged jaw. So my lamprey is now going to come out by itself, and everything else has a hinged jaw. And so then I just keep working my way through this. Okay, I've got a salamander now that has a hinged jaw. It has um, a backbone, and it has four walking legs. Okay, um, but a tuna there that does not. Okay, so it has a hinged jaw, so it's going to come after the hinged jaw. But that's going to be another branch point. Right, to have the four walking legs. Okay, and so now my salamander does not have the shelled egg. Sorry, I started to write shelled because that's what I said. So there's my salamander. Okay, I've got my shelled egg. And now I've got uh, the last characteristic there of hair. Okay, and so the turtle doesn't have hair, but the leopard does. And so based on this particular phylogenetic tree, okay, um, turtles and leopards are actually most commonly related. Are the most, um, they're the most related. They have the most recent common ancestor. They share a lot more of these characteristics than the other organisms do. Okay, um, wherever you see the characteristic, for instance, vertebral column there. Everything that branches off after it's gonna to have to have a vertebral column, like the lamprey, the tuna, salamander, turtle, leopard, okay? Um, those branch points are what are separating them off. But this would be a way that you could draw a very um, simple phylogenetic tree based on morphology. And so like I said, we'll be practicing this in class as well.